On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Mike Britton. He is the VP of Engineering at Transfix. We're going to be talking about some of the components that have gone into people working remote, but also some of the you know, challenges that we might be seeing for people coming back to the office or challenges of people relocating to areas that they might not be able to come back and some of the constraints that Mike's been having to deal with. He's had some interesting challenges that he's dealt with and he has some insights that I hope he's going to share and we're lucky to have him on the podcast. Mike, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So I know you're the VP of engineering at a high level. Can you tell us you know, what you do at Transfix and what Transfix does? And we'll jump right in. Sure. I'll jump in with uh, Transfix to begin with. And we are a freight marketplace. So we're in the business of connecting shippers who have things to move with carriers who can move them. And the freight ecosystem in trucking in the US and North America is, is very splinter. There's like about half a million different carrier companies running about three and a half million trucks. So if you're a shipper that has lots to move, you've got to talk with lots of different carriers. And we fit in the middle there to make sure that all that gets connected. We're bringing software and data to automate a lot of processes and drive increased utilization for the carriers that we work with. And in doing so, we believe we can drive better pricing for both the carrier side and the shipper side. So we see this as uh, economically somewhere that everybody can win in this situation. My role here is I've you know joined two years ago to work with CTO Jonathan, who is one of the co-founders of the company, and I've been here helping build out the team and run the you know engineering from a day-to-day standpoint, you know from a standpoint of organizational development, planning and prioritization, hiring, performance management, retention, and sort of thinking about you know just strategically how do we grow the team and be you know increase you know team capacity and improve you know skill set and capability of the team overall. Absolutely. And I know uh, talking to you, you've been going, obviously, like everyone that had to deal with a lot with the pandemic, seems like we're, you know, with the vaccine might be at the tail end of having to think about different solutions to different problems. Maybe starting at the top would be kind of nice. And kind of maybe if you can explain, let's say, you know, 2019, it feels like a long time ago now. But uh, (laughs) what was the team like? Were you all in the office at that point? Or what was the structure overall? Yeah, I joined the team in early 2019. And to be honest, one of the things that really I was excited about, I've been in other teams that had become you know remote over time and had more of a split between in office and out of office. But I was really attracted to being again in a smaller company, you know, one that I knew that we would plan to be growing over time, but being back into somewhat of a simple, everybody in the same room, you know, easy to collaborate, easy to see what people are up to. And and just check in. And, and so, you know, a team of about, you know, 20 or 25 engineers at the time, you know, everybody in the same place, easy to meet people, easy to keep up. And uh, that was really attractive. And we're all based in our New York headquarters, which houses uh, roughly uh, 200 people now. We expanded our floor space in 2019 and done some renovation in there. And so, you know, when COVID hit, it was kind of at a point where we were all really prepared to be co-located in one place and continue to expand the team there. So, you know, we're certainly not unique in this situation, but COVID certainly like turned the tables on us in 2020. Absolutely. And I guess uh, fast forward to the present day, I'm assuming everyone's remote and maybe just highlight, you know, how that looks for you now. Yep. So absolutely right. Like, you know, middle of March, like pretty much everybody else, we went remote and it was, you know, somewhat overnight. We had been tracking what was going on, like many companies were and took some time for us to really get to a decision of exactly what to do. And I recall, you know, I think it was probably a, I think it might have been Wednesday afternoon when we said, look, we're going to start talking about having a voluntary work from home, if you prefer, as we're just trying to figure out how everybody is going to accommodate, you know, working from home. Because, you know, our engineering team actually has been quite flexible over time. And I think everybody on the team had you know, experience working from home, you know, here and there as necessary. But there were certainly other functions within the company who had not, you know, worked remotely at all. So making that transition was, you know, there's a big question mark around it. But when, you know, the moment it became voluntary, my entire team was out the next day. I think I was the only one who was in the office. And I was primarily there to make sure that we could figure out plans for the other functions who had never worked remotely. And I've, I have worked remotely Myself, I've you know worked with distributed teams, and you know both from folks who are working from home and folks working from a variety of different offices, but wanted to be part of figuring out how we're going to have the rest of the company transition into into a fully remote setup. And I guess um, that setup now. I mean, how many time zones are you guys stretched across, and kind of you know what do you do for core hours? 
so we, you know, if we back up to March, you know, everybody was really, I can't account for every single person in the company, but I'd say pretty much everybody was in the New York area and either working from home or, you know, working from, you know, friends or, you know, some people had moved off to family homes and, and such. I think what we found in the first month or so was quite immediately realized, you know, we've got a number of people in our workforce who had leases that were expiring and they didn't know whether they wanted to stay in New York or, or leave New York. But early on, we all had the assumption that we would be back in the office shortly. And I think shortly is sort of a you know relative term, but it certainly was a big question mark for a lot of people of how soon you'd be back into you know day-to-day commuting. So I think everybody largely stayed pretty close to New York area. And then over the coming weeks and months, we certainly saw more and more drift. And at this point, I know that we're across roughly, you know, my team across tech, I think is, I think we encompass about 10 different states now. And we've got folks in the US, Canada, and Mexico, as we've started to, you know, move just from what, you know, who was on staff originally, but also has taken on more of a remote first uh, hiring approach. But that transition took some time and, and it, you know, I think we're trying to figure out what the right sort of guidance and guardrails were to set around that. And coming back to your question about time zones, like we've really focused on keeping track of, you know, our core customers are our internal operations team and their working day is from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern. So I've really focused on trying to keep, you know, a team that's able to collaborate on, you know, essentially Eastern time zone meaning that we're optimizing for folks who are in central and eastern time zone. And when we get into Canada, we're talking about Atlantic time zone as well. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting challenge, especially as you're, you know, becoming remote first and trying to where to see where you can draw the lines of hiring, because obviously you're within two time zones and then slowly you're like, well, you know, somebody in Denver, it's yeah, not that bad. And then little by little, as before you know it, you know, all of a sudden now you've, uh, I mean, once you get to California or the West Coast, it becomes a a significant that three hour gap is amazing because uh you know I think if you have the energy to do the six a m start date, your day's done sooner, but that's not necessary for everyone, yeah, I think that's true, and I think it you know my decision making here stems from experience of managing teams that span from San Francisco to Paris, and I was you know in the middle of that working from a company in based in Brooklyn, so you know my day would start early and it could end late. And what was important there, obviously, was we tried to limit the number of folks who were in Europe who had to overlap with folks in San Francisco. But what I learned, you know, through working with folks who are remote, you know, I think it always starts with best intentions that everybody's going to time shift to one place. But, you know, we also, in engineering and, you know, technical roles, we tend to be pretty flexible about work-life balance and try to give people a lot of flexibility in, in how they manage their days. And, you know, over time, that tends to drift to whatever sort of natural for your own time zone. So while you may start with, you know, time shifted to Eastern, I think it's difficult. It's not impossible, but it is difficult to keep that, you know, over a period of years. And if I'm looking for a team that is, you know, engaged over a long period of time, like that's a long haul to be pulling those early hours consistently. And then, you know, the other thing that does happen over time, and I've seen this as, as teams mature and you know, people have longer and longer tenures in a company you start to get into situations with, you know, you've got families and kids and you it's not just like your own time, but it's the dynamics of when do your kids have to be at school and when is pickup and things like that, where, you know, that flexibility doesn't become just independently, when do you want to be working your own hours, but, you know, what's the rest of your day life look like in terms of where you've got dependencies and constraints elsewhere? Absolutely. And I guess, you know, people are, yeah, but those are certainly issues as, as you kind of uh, get more responsibilities. Core hours become a little bit trickier, hundred percent. I guess when you go back and people, you know, over the time it's been uh, a year, clearly a year uh, that we've been in the state of this pandemic. Have people been leaving where they were? I guess you know somebody who started with the company. Let's say they were in the city in New York City. Are you seeing people relocate outside the area? And is that a common thing that's happened to you guys? Yes, we are. You know, I don't know how much I would say common across the company, but I know that. You alluded to the fact that we've become more of a remote-centric team in engineering, and that stems from back in May. Ironically, when we started working from home for a short bit of time in March, I didn't have a good sense of how long we were going to be all operating this way. I, you know, left everything on my desk. I didn't do a good job packing and being that <laughs> that well prepared for the long haul of this. But after about two months of it, recognized, you know, we started thinking about when do people get back into the office and. 
our time frame was really, you know, big question marks around it. We knew that we would start to think about it towards the end of the year. And we knew that there'd be a long ramp up period. And we knew that there were question marks about vaccines and therapeutics. And then you start to get to the end of that. You know, I think we also <laughs> recognize that engineering if, of all the functions would probably be the last one to return to the office. And it looked like, you know, this could very easily be a year to 18 months until we can be back in. And, and that's the point when we said, you know, it's better for us to, you know, call it now and make a decision. Is this a good opportunity for us to really transition the team full time to being remote? Because by the time we're all said and done with this, everybody in engineering will have been doing this for a long, long time. And, you know, to the point uh, we were making earlier, folks need to make decisions about, you know, where they're going to be over the long term. And, you know, leases in New York are not cheap. As people didn't have a reason to be in the office in New York, the question was, you know, what do I do with my lease? Do I need to stay here? Should I move on? And so we really pushed to, you know, as hard as I think it was with the uncertainty, we really pushed to make a decision that would help you know, our team be able to plan their lives and make decisions that way. So, you know, in terms of have people spread out? Yes. And then I think that we've enabled that by being very clear about how and when to have those conversations and what, you know, like I said before about time zones, like what we're optimizing for. And so, you know, I talked to the team, you know, early, early on, even before we fully made this decision said, you know, at some point we may have to be back in the office. And until we know more, you know, details about that, just keep in mind, you know, the people we support work seven to seven and the work that we do, you know, collaboration happens online. So like you need to have a good, stable internet connection. Don't, you know, move out to the sticks where there's no connectivity. And so, you know, we just try to provide the right guidance for people to make those decisions. And then as soon as possible, you know, once we knew for sure that we were going to be a permanently distributed engineering team. We shared that quickly as well and said, you know, if you're making plans to move, you need to talk to your manager and we need to talk to our HR team to just make sure we can support you in terms of wherever you're going to be. And we'll make that decision. We'll talk openly and transparently about any guidance around it, but we can do that. And so that's how we've arrived at a point where we've got folks who are across so many different states at this point. Interesting. I know we were talking about a lot of the challenges that... um... You know, I talked to a lot of people on the talent side, on the engineering side, management, you know, sometimes on the podcast, sometimes before podcasts. And the number one thing I'm asking people, because it comes up from the candidates, right? From people asking questions of what's going to happen with, uh, you know, compensation if I leave, you know, somebody was like, I'm going to you know, accept this job. And then maybe in three to four months, I'm going to move someplace lower cost of living. You know, are they going to lower it then? You know, do they have plans around how they'll adjust or will they just keep me at the salary and, you know, remote first is good, but is it pandemic remote first? And then, you know, they're going to expect me to move back. I mean, I guess because we still don't have, you know, hard and fast uh, experience of the shift back, like when you're starting to look at some of those questions, are those the questions that are at the top of your mind? Are there other things that you're seeing potentially and going back to the office as other issues? Yeah, I guess there's a few questions to answer there, but I will talk about that idea about salary and and what happens there. I think that you know a couple of companies came out early on and said, you know, we'll support people who are remote and if you're moving in different places that may have an implication on compensation. I think that that's appropriate. We thought about that early on because we knew that I recognize like that's going to be a question that comes up and it's going to be one that we have to tackle and it's better for us to tackle it head on than to make a bunch of sort of one-off decisions that might be inequitable for a lot of different people. So we did some modeling on this. We thought about what would be the right way of compensating across different regions where we strike the right balance of between cost of living, competition for labor. You know, we're not doing a single ban that's, you know, all people get paid exactly the same thing because we'd never be able to pay everybody in New York wages. Or we, you know, the the other side of it is like if we didn't pay New York wages for everybody, we'd never be able to hire anybody in the New York area. So since we're targeting people sort of, you know, in lots of different regions, we've gone with a multi-region approach to this, and we're certainly not pegging it to, you know, what the sort of baseline pay is through some of these salary aggregators for each city. I think we're paying highly competitive, but we are, you know, having some discount from region to region. And I think, you know, the other part that's important about this, I think, is like I value that as people's tenure and skill sets increase, their value in the market also increases as well. So while we have these different bands, they actually towards the upper end of your you know professional career, they actually converge essentially together, where if you're 15 years into your career in engineering 
and you're a staff engineer, it likely doesn't matter where you live. You're likely going to have a, you know, equal competition for San Francisco, New York, or, you know, sort of anywhere else you might be living. So we've tried to take a, an approach that is, you know, strikes the right balance across all of those. And I think to your point, there's a lot that is going to play out in the coming year or two around the shifts of where people are working and what companies are doing in terms of hybrid, in-person, or fully remote that are, I believe are likely to have a pretty big impact in what compensation looks like in the industry. And, and we're taking a stance where we're going to keep watching this and keep seeing the trends and react as necessary. Yeah, the interesting uh, conversation that I'm hearing, and it's early because uh, I've only heard it for about a month or two, and I don't know if it's a trend or it's just a couple people, but I'm getting from candidates that I talk to, they go, listen, I'm, I'm getting calls of, you know, for all these remote roles and everyone expects me a discount because I'm in Kansas City or I'm wherever else that's not a you know, national tech hub. And I want to be paid based on skill and not based on geography. And what's interesting is like, I'm talking to five, 10 different companies from Silicon Valley, from New York City, from Austin. You know, they're all varying in terms of how they will accommodate that. And it's kind of changing the expectation of candidates in the non, you know, VC funded tech hubs to kind of realize that it's like almost like a driver to level up comp in those non areas. So I don't know how that's going to play out, but I think as more companies are reaching out to people in non traditional, you know, tech environments, I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't plenty of tech talent in, you know, outside the major hubs, but it's an interesting scenario that could drive up overall comp into those cities and all of a sudden expectations for local companies who are basically paying maybe 30% less than somebody who's getting in New York City will also have to compete on a higher salary level to get that same talent locally that is yeah i think that's true and you know there's i think there's two sides of that one which is if more and more companies are willing to hire remote then they're going to, you know, what we've seen is we're now interviewing people from states and regions, cities that we've never interviewed people from before, because it it used to be the limiting factor was, you know, if you were going to apply and we were going to take an application seriously, it meant that you're going to relocate to New York City. And that filters out a lot of people, you know, so as that opens up, I do think you're right, that'll raise competition and, and compensation in a lot of these other areas. And I think on the other hand, you know, my reflection on this is that we've for a long time paid, you know, higher in, in, you know, some of these larger tech cities because we're paying a premium on people being in person. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's hard for me to project how much that's going to change over time. I mean, I know that it'll like have a pretty strong feeling this will be, you know, some significant percentage points improvement or change. But I don't know that it's like half the industry is changing all over to, you know, fully remote. I don't, don't expect that. But I think that that does change, you know, what competition looks like in these local areas, which will have some kind of effect on compensation. But it's interesting. I mean, it's just like, you know, competition or talent is really a market in a lot of different ways. And there's so many variables that play into it. And we're just trying to take this from a standpoint, like we want to, you know, approach this from a standpoint of being as systematic and objective about it as possible and, and just being transparent with people, whether it's you know, making an offer to somebody who's, you know, going to be joining the team or whether we're talking about, you know, somebody who's relocating. I think it's still early days. And I think, you know, the flip to this conversation is, you know, people going back into the office. And I know before, you know, the conversation was always, and I brought this up with somebody else, and I'm always curious to see as, you know, VP engineering, you know, what you see from your team is a lot of times it was like, I want to be remote. I can't wait to be remote. And you know, I jump at a remote chance. And now that we've all done it for a year, do you hear from people on the team? It's like, you know what? I miss that office. I, I, I miss being in there. You know, you know, when can we go back? Is the flip side happening now that it's been like a full year of people, you know, being in their homes? Yeah, I think we've got a mix of it. And we've tried to keep a bit of a finger on the pulse along with what we see internally. I'm also listening to what people are are learning externally and, and surveys and other you know things you see in the news about the tech industry and, and where people want to be. My gut says that we're largely gut, I should actually say like this is informed by what people are telling me as well, but largely we err on the side of people are you know happy to be remote. And if we force everybody to return to the office, that there'd be a lot of people who would be disappointed by that. On the flip side, there are certainly a population of people who miss out on the in-person collaboration, you know, and whether that is 
directly with people on their teams or just you know being in an office with other people on a day-to-day basis because their day-to-day may not have that much interaction with other people and you know to each their own i don't want to suggest that one is any better than the other you know we made a choice that was enabling remote and you know for the long term and for folks who are in new york city and will continue to be in new york city we're still investigating what we can do to make sure that we have flexible space in the office. So if you want to work out of the office on a day-to-day basis, you can and should. But I think it's going to be relative to the entire population of our engineering group. I think it's probably going to be a minority for sure. Yeah, and I mean, this raises, I think we mentioned it, uh, potential retention problem, right? I mean, obviously, people have expectations both ways from going back in, not going back in. I get people who ask, you know, if it's not remote permanently and you know, they have firm plans to keep it. I'm not even entertaining the company. So in terms of retention problems, I mean, obviously there'll be a certain percentage that <laughs> you can't satisfy everyone, obviously, but this definitely could be a, an issue. Yeah. And I think this is one of the biggest, you know, latent retention problems that the industry is going to have, which is, you know, in the coming months, you know, I think the projection right now is we'll hit like a 75% vaccination rate sometime in July in the US. And as companies start bringing people back into the office and making their plans known in terms of what are expectations for the future, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of people who look at what has my life been like for the last year? What do I want it to be like in the future? Because, you know, many folks have been, you know, now had the opportunity to work remotely for a year. And they've also previously had the opportunity to work in person, probably for, you know, possibly multiple years of their career. And they've got good experience with both and, and, and might, you know, <laughs> it's hard to predict which direction they're going to make a choice. But I think that the challenge here is I think there's going to be more opportunities on both sides there where, you know, if you've got teams like mine who are fully remote, I've got people I'm sure who are going to say, but I really value being in, in person. I want to work with a fully in-person team. And so I'm going to go, you know, interview at a new company, you know, that is going to be fully co-located in one place. Likewise, the opposite exists, which is if I said, you know, everybody's going to now be back in the office in New York, I'd have a bunch of people who say, well, you know, thanks very much. But I know that there's a bunch of remote companies out there and I'm really enjoyed working from home all the time and the flexibility that enables. And so I'm going to go look for another company that is fully remote. You know, frankly, I don't think that we've seen any of that tip. And I don't think we will see any of that tip until the point where companies are able to, you know, on a large scale, sort of make those decisions about getting back into the office or not. I think it's interesting because you're definitely right. And people shifted a lot of, you know, processes to accommodate, and then potentially they're going to have to be altered again to be more of a true hybrid distributed team, you know, some co-located, some fully remote. And all of a sudden, What is a Zoom meeting now for everyone? And it's easy because everyone's behind a desk. It's going to be interesting because you're going to have, you know, six people in the office, eight people out of the office. And a Zoom meeting means what, you know, just everyone stay at your desk anyways, because it's just an easier way versus having, you know, a camera pointing in a conference room. So I think there'll be some interesting changes, which obviously we've already gone through a lot of interesting changes, but I think there'll be definitely a few more wrinkles before we get to whatever new normal is in, you know, six months a year. That's an important one to call out. Like so when I look back at March of 2020, I think if I had made the decision to take the team remote and something like COVID hadn't happened, it would have been working, you know, completely upstream against the rest of the company who is all in person, and that would have been a difficult thing to transition. I think that, you know, our decision around becoming remote was really enabled because the entire company has been working this way and we're essentially all forced to all at the same point. But I do think one of the difficulties that we're going to face coming up is now, you know, getting to a point of developing what would be a hybrid culture and making sure that the folks in the office don't, you know, who are all in a, you know, shared meeting room, let's say, and we've got, you know, some other number of folks joining a meeting who are remote, that we don't lose the, call it empathy for what it's like to be on the other side of the screen and that we don't like lose touch with, you know, how noisy and, and disruptive the audio and visual can be, you know, when you've got a split between some people sitting around one table and and others who are, you know, behind their laptops in, in individual locations. So I, I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can, you know, adapt to that and make, you know, take it, you know, head on and, and make sure we sort of set the right expectations up front. 
that is going to be a challenge for us for sure. I think we've adapted thus far, you know, on a dime in a lot of cases. And I think now with a little bit of planning and an opportunity to know processes are going to have to be altered. I think obviously uh, I say that, but also I look and go, sometimes when you rip the bandaid off, you're forced to adapt versus when you know you have six months a year to plan for something, you're still not procrastinating, but you're not as uh, invested in, in the solution as, as you could be. Yeah, I think that, you know, if there's been a theme in the last year, it's been adaptation. And I think that what you're getting out of ripping the Band-Aid off, I think if I were to, to look back and say what has been the places where I feel like I've been more successful this last year, it has been making choices, you know, making decisions so that we can move forward and not just sit and wait and wait and wait for what's going to happen and how is this going to turn out. That's a great observation. And I think part of that is making that decision. I, I know we're all, y'all are running scrum two week sprints because you don't want to do the waterfall and spend a lot of time upfront analysis. And if it goes wrong, it's really expensive to go back and fix code. But yet a lot of the decision making that happens for the macro it's a little bit more upfront decision-making and a little bit slower to implement, which is opposite of how the actual engineering team runs. But in this case, uh, you got to rip it off, see what happens, fix it, refactor and move forward. Yep. And along with that, I think you know, probably the most important piece of that is to make sure you bring everybody along for the ride with you and be as transparent in your leadership as possible. That is probably the top of the list of, of making sure whatever change works is that, that transparency and making sure everyone is fully understanding, has the visibility and, and knows what that impact is going to be because it is impacting everyone's lives to a big extent. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Mike, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I know uh, I was actually thinking it'd be nice to have you back on six to 10 months out to see how things evolved. I'm going to be, you know, I'd be super curious to see what the world looks like then and uh, kind of see how processes have changed. Obviously, we'll keep an eye out when those changes occur for you, because I'd love to have you back on to kind of talk about those things. Absolutely. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And I think, a, you know, another check-in in the future will be a great learning experience, won't it? Awesome. We'll include your LinkedIn with the show notes in case somebody wants to reach out with any questions. And until next episode, that's it for this one. I always ask for two things. One, send me your ideas and, you know, comments, feedback topics that you might want me to talk about in future podcast episodes. And secondly, keep subscribing and along with the subscription of the podcast, leave us a review. I'd I'd love the feedback. We can only uh, hope to improve it with that. Until next time, thanks.